Cave Hotel is a large and commodious establishment capable of entertaining 500 guests. It is constructed on the cottage plan and the rooms are furnished in a style equal to any first class hotel. It is the beau ideal of a fashionable summer resort in the south. A magnificent ballroom is attached to the hotel. Curious sandstone rock, excavated near the cave about 15 years since and now to be seen in the hotel yard. Path leading to the mouth of the cave is about a quarter of a mile in length, extending from the hotel through a gorge and a dense wood. Visitors generally supply themselves with stout branches from the trees to assist themselves in their explorations of the rugged paths of the cave. Out for the last time. This is a picture of the gentleman who conceived and executed the project of photographing the cave with the reflectors and etc. used. Mouth of the Cave is 194 feet above Green River, 125 feet in height, by 30 in width. In summer, visitors experience a sudden change of temperature when they stand on the embankment above the entrance and a cold blast rushes out of the cave. The temperature is invariably 59 degrees. The scene looking down towards the immediate entrance, a distance of 100 yards, is picturesque in the extreme and impresses the beholder with a feeling of awe at the contemplation of the subterraneous world beneath his feet. Mouth of the Cave. This view introduces three well-known guides. The one on the right is Old Matt. He's acted in the capacity of a guide for the last 30 years. Gothic Chapel. A mile from the entrance is a large room, from the ceiling of which hang gigantic stalactites extending to the floor. It's represented here as it appeared when lit up with magnesium light, the glare of which may be seen behind the columns on the right. Column of Hercules. It's also in the Gothic Chapel. It is formed by the union of stalactites and stalagmites, is eight feet in height and 30 in circumference. The length of time necessary to form such a column may be inferred from the fact that it takes 50 years to form an incrustation no thicker than a wafer. The Altar. In the foreground is a cluster of columns called the Altar, at which a romantic marriage took place between two parties whose union on the face of the earth was prevented by family interference. Devil's Armchair. In Gothic Avenue is a large column about 500 yards beyond the chapel. There's a niche or seat at which one of the guides may be seen sitting. The ceiling of Gothic Avenue is singularly beautiful as the stalactites assume the most fantastic shapes. In the niche of this column, the celebrated Jenny Lind rested for some time during her visit to the cave. End of Gothic Avenue. The avenue terminates about a half mile beyond the chapel at Elephant's Head and Lover's Leap. The former is a large stalagmite shaped like the head of the animal after which it's named. And the latter is a rock projecting 16 feet over a black abyss. Wandering Willie's Spring. It's a small rill of water trickling down from the roof and the wall of rock on the left-hand side of the main cave beyond the Rotunda and Methodist Church. It's named after a country violinist who wandered away from his party, had his lamp extinguished, and was found lying asleep beside the spring. On the left will be observed some names of visitors cut on the rock. The spring is about a half mile from the entrance. Standing Rocks are 15 feet in length and many tons in weight, and evidently fell from the roof of the cave at the time when the entire cave was filled with water. They stand in an upright position and are three quarters of a mile from the entrance. Entrance to Rocky Hall. Looking from the main cave, a few feet beyond standing rocks, to the left of the main cave is Rocky Hall. It's reached by ascending a few steps of rocks piled at the entrance. Giant's Coffin is an immense rock 40 feet long, 20 feet wide, and 8 feet high, which has been detached from the avenue against which it rests. On the left, beneath the coffin, may be seen a narrow passage, which leads into deserted chamber. 
Giant's Coffin presents a gloomy, sceptral appearance when lit up with the glare of the magnesium light. It's on the right of the main cave, one mile from the entrance. Entrance to Long Root. It's on the left of Giant's Coffin and so narrow and low that visitors have to stoop almost to the ground in passing through it. On the right may be seen the end of Giant's Coffin. By some it is supposed that the water receded from the main cave through this passage. Deserted Chamber is a dreary looking room about 100 feet in length. The guide in the picture is entering the chamber from the narrow passage beneath the Giant's Coffin. In wooden bowl chamber adjoining this apartment, a curious looking Indian bowl was found. The Indians used long reeds filled with deer's fat as torches to guide them through the cave. Goran's Dome is 200 feet high and 60 feet wide. It's reached by descending from the deserted chamber to a narrow rugged causeway called the Labyrinth, then passing over a small bridge and ascending a ladder. The far side appears like an immense curtain. When there's a rise in the subterraneous rivers, the floor of the dome is covered with water in which eyeless fish are caught. The view is taking halfway between the roof and the floor. It's called after one of the former proprietors of the cave. The bottomless pit and bridge of size are on the main route to Echo River and a mile and a half from the entrance. The pit is of immense depth and over it is thrown a substantial wooden bridge across which visitors pass in the long route towards Pensacola Avenue. The pit presents a sight of awful sublimity when its steep sides are lighted up by the guide. View from the Bridge of Size shows a part of Shelby's dome overhanging the terrible pit. It's wild and dreary beyond conception. The dark avenue to the right is inaccessible to human footsteps. That is supposed to lead to a vast distance further into the bowels of the earth. Beyond the Bridge of Sighs, this view represents two of the guides having just crossed the bridge toward Reveler's Hall. They are facing the bottomless pit, overhanging which is the rock in the foreground. Pit beneath the bridge. Here are the steep sides of the bottomless pit far below the bridge. The view is taken from a narrow ledge of rocks overhanging the fearful chasm. The rock on the right projects 30 feet and extends from the brink of the pit to 50 feet below the bridge. Wild Hall is in Pensacola Avenue. The floor is strewn with immense rocks that have become detached from the roof. The cliffs on the left are called the snow cliffs as they seem to be covered with flakes of snow. It is two miles from the entrance. Snowball Archway is also in Pensacola Avenue. The ceiling of white gypsum looks as if it was covered with snow and presents a most beautiful appearance. Symmetry of the natural buttresses which project from the side of the cliff is also striking and interesting. Grand Crossing is in Pensacola Avenue. Here four large avenues branch off from the main one. The rocks here are completely covered with the names of visitors scratched on them. Grand Crossing is about two miles and a quarter from the entrance. Angelica's Grotto is also in Pensacola Avenue. The little girl in the picture is resting on Angelica's couch over the foot of which hangs the pineapple bush, a curious looking rock. Scotchman's Trap is on the road to the river about 500 yards from the bottomless pit. The trap is a small circular opening through which it is necessary to descend a few steps to go toward the river. Over this narrow opening is suspended a huge rock, many tons in weight, which, if it fell, would completely close up the avenue leading to the Echo River. The guide in the picture is standing at the head of the steps. Dining in Great Relief is entered after passing through the narrow, torturous passage called Fat Man's Misery. It is indeed a relief for the aching bones of the visitor after threading the narrow path above mentioned, and the dinner party in the picture seemed to think so. One of the guides is pouring some of Kentucky's unrivaled beverage, bourbon whiskey, for the relief of his companions. Bacon Chamber is situated to the right of River Hall, which is entered from the Great Relief. 
The curious projections from the roof, resembling flitches of bacon, are caused by the action of water at a period when the chamber was completely filled. It is one of the best views taken in the cave. Bandit Hall is immediately above Bacon Chamber and at the commencement of Sparks Avenue, which leads to Mammoth Dome. Several unexplored avenues branch off here in every direction. The scene represents a party of bandits at dinner and as reviewed by the magnesium light, exceeds in romantic wildness the most extravagant conceptions of Salvador Rosa. Pillars in Mammoth Dome. The Mammoth Dome is one of the largest in the world. It is 250 feet in height and of immense size. Those pillars are of colossal dimensions and standing beneath them, one would imagine himself amid the ruins of some Egyptian temple. Corinthian Columns. Those columns are at the furthest extremity of Mammoth Dome and resemble the broken columns of the Acropolis of Athens and Corinth. Cliffs over the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is a black, ominous looking body of water about 40 feet below the terrace on which the three persons in the picture are standing. Visitors pass along the terrace and descend the ladder on their way to the river. The sea lies below the foot of the rock over which the parties in the view are looking. Old Bull's Concert Room is a mile and a half beyond Echo River and five miles from the entrance. It's at the end of Silliman's Avenue. The Black Gorge to the right is the entrance to Pass of El Gore. The celebrated violinist performed in this room during his visit to the cave. Hanging Rocks are in the Pass of El Gore, about a mile from Old Bull's concert room. Visitors experience much uneasiness in passing under these rocks, as they seem to be on the point of tumbling down on their heads. But since the discovery of the cave, no rocks have been known to fall in any part of it. Martha's Vineyard is elevated about 20 feet above the Pass of El Gore and receives its name from the appearance, shape, and size of the dark stalactite formations on the side and roof, which closely resemble grapes. Martha's Vineyard is six and a half miles from the entrance. Grape Clusters. This view shows a section of the side of Martha's Vineyard and sufficiently explains the meaning of the name which has been given it. The entire walls of the vineyard are covered with pendant clusters of mineral grapes. Snowball Chamber is about a quarter of a mile beyond Martha's Vineyard. The roof seems to be one mass of snowballs, each of which is from two to four inches in diameter. Mary's Bower is situated in Cleveland's cabinet. The flowers here represented are of a very delicate formation. Rosa's Bower is another section of the roof in Cleveland's cabinet and consists of a beautiful collection of gypsum flowers resembling roses and dahlias. Cross and Flower Garden represent a section of the roof of Cleveland's cabinet. Two crevices intersect each other at right angles and are lined with beautiful flowers formed of plaster of Paris. The Last Rose of Summer. This is one of the most beautiful gypsum formations in the cave. It is eight inches in diameter and of snowy whiteness. The distance from the entrance to this point in Cleveland Cabinet is seven and a half miles. And from here to the end of the long route, one and a half miles.